776 BC, a long time before any of us in here were born, even me. Um, we had athletes participating in Olympic type sports, the first of which were fist fighting and wrestling, so you can imagine fist fighting and wrestling. There were probably a few people getting their heads knocked around. Um, and that's where, from that time of Hippocrates, is where the first symptoms of concussion have actually been put down and described. So been around for a long time, like it was almost 3,000 years. But even though it's been around for 3,000 years that we've sort of known about it, our knowledge of what this injury is and how to treat it and how to better management um, has really only um, taken off probably in the last 25 years or so. I gave a lecture about that time ago when I was a chief resident. Um, and aside from how you get a concussion, the rest of that lecture is pretty much useless today, how we think about treating them. Um, so I like ice sports, but I'm truly a baseball junkie, so I had to put this up here. Um, the, if you can't read the caption, just look on the bright side. For one brief, glorious moment, you, you forgot you were on the Cubs. So that was obviously before they won't have any awards. We know concussions are serious. We take them, you know, more seriously now than we did before. I remember when I was in high school, looking back now, I probably had when I took an elbow to the head playing basketball, went over to the sidelines, looked at the coach, it's like, are you okay? And I kind of remember pausing, you know, staring off in the blankness of space and whatever. I was like, uh, yeah, I guess. Go play. <laughs> if that would have been today, one of these two of our athletic trainers would have definitely pulled me out. Um, we have new guidelines and recommendations. Um, concussions in sports are going to continue. As long as people are getting bigger, faster competing, there will be concussions. We've done a lot to try to prevent them. You know, if you look at helmets and everything, you know, from ice hockey, uh, football, lacrosse, we've improved helmets a lot in the past 30 years. We still have concussions every week. And the key is to making a timely diagnosis and getting someone started in a management program quickly. Um, so what is a concussion? Minor traumatic brain injury caused by either direct blow to the head, right? So ice, you wipe out, hit your head against the wall, the ice. Um, or a rapid um, deceleration. So think whiplash type injury when you're in a car wreck. You may not connect with anything, but that back and forth, that will do it. Contrary to popular belief, they do not have a loss of consciousness for the most part. Um, you know, we've heard it, all of us have heard it. I wasn't knocked out, I don't have a concussion. And the other one we hear even from the ERs, my CT or MRI was normal, I don't have a concussion. Absolutely not true. Because if your CT is positive when you go in initially, the next thing you're buying from one of our local hospitals is a helicopter ride to a big care center or a university center because it either means you have a big bleed in your brain or a fractured skull. Obviously, neither of those are good. Um, a lot of fuss has been made about this over the past several years. We get, um, you know, close to over 200 million people participating in sports between um, children and adolescents. Um, and the latest statistics are about 4 million concussions um, per year with organized activity and recognition um, and recreational sports. Um, that number is probably higher because they don't get reported. Athletes on the sideline don't say anything. Somebody just messing around playing backyard football doesn't say anything. Um, people just want to continue to play. Um, and sometimes they're just not recognized. Even when you say, oh, I'm dizzy or whatever, but don't recognize it as a concussion because there's not the training out there that there needs to be. Um, high school sports account for almost half a million injuries now of head injuries. Um, and that's three and a half to four percent of all the injuries that we see. Um, closed head injuries in kids. Sure, they can happen anywhere, but about a quarter of them are directly related to sports in some sort. So, of course, the highest number of concussions are seen in the contact sports. Football, hockey, soccer, wrestling, any of basketball, field hockey, which there's not supposed to be any contact. Um, baseball and softball. And in our program, um, of all the athletes we've seen, 
pick a sport, even some obscure sport, we've seen someone concuss from that sport. Even something ridiculous like golf, cross country, tennis, swimming. Swimming especially around here, and it's not somebody goofing up a flip turn and hitting the wall. It's because our pool space is so crowded, probably much like your ice space is you know, kind of crowded. They're getting elbowed and kicked and kneed and whatever in the head while they're trying to do their laps. So, and, and I said, you know, cross country was a kid who was out running, was trying to pass somebody, went sort of round them on the path and raised up too early and hit a branch. And, just, <laughs> and that, you know, that doesn't count car accidents and falling on the ice and, you know, falling in the shower or whatever, kind of silly things. Um, so, about 11% of all the injuries in the U.S. are related to football. Um, and depending on the size of your school, you can expect up to 20 players a year to have a concussion in a high school. So it's about 6-7% per season. So what causes it? Butting heads, right? I mean, that's what we classically think of, or hitting the wall or, or whatever. So there's that acceleration, and then there's a stop. And then the brain is suspended, kind of like an egg inside a shell. So just like shaking that egg, and you make scrambled eggs inside. Um, and what we're noticing now is there are rotational forces that are probably more important to how long your injury is going to last. So think boxing, somebody gets hit, and that kind of thing. Or hit in football or hockey where there's that rotation. In there. Um, so we look at four major areas of symptoms. The physical, you know, everybody has a headache. Um, you can have vision problems. Cognitive, you're confused, you got kind of that fog. Um, and fog's kind of an interesting thing. I don't know how to define it, to tell you what the definition is, but anybody who's ever had a head injury knows exactly <laughs> what we're talking about, right? Anybody in here? Heck yeah. <laughs> so you know, you know that foggy feeling, right? You just can't explain it. Emotional, which is uh, something that I've sort of learned along the way how prominent this is. You know, there's anxiety and depression, but there's some acute personality changes sometimes that happen. Um, I might be suffering. Reading that error. And it's so important to have parents, coaches, athletic trainers on the sidelines who know the athletes. You know, at, at a high school, you know, I'm there once or twice a week. I don't know every kid that well. A um, great case, long time ago, really good quarterback at one of our local high schools, was being recruited by a bunch of schools, got hit pretty good. The athletic trainer said, hey, can you come take a look at him? I thought he was being your typical prima donna athlete, I'm a superstar recruiting jerk. And she said, this isn't him. And he, and whatever. Later on, you do see a lot of depression and anxiety. Some of that's a direct result from whichever area the brain is injured. But also, some of it probably has to do to, we have highly competitive athletes who are good in school, who now can't participate in their sport, who are falling behind in school, we're worried about grades, we're, you know, we're not out doing the stuff we normally do, so they get anxious and depressed and tired of it all. And then sleep changes, and that goes all across the board as well. Some people want to sleep all the time, some people can't sleep, some people have disrupted sleep, so that's all over the place. Um, so, acute management. That's what we're here on the sidelines for, to evaluate them, get them out of the game, practice whatever if we need to, and to see if there's any need to do anything further immediately. As I said, for most cases, a CT or an MRI, the night that this happens, is going to tell you absolutely nothing. But if we see signs of some sort of neurologic deterioration, or there are signs that we can see that may indicate skull fracture or something, they're off to the emergency room and getting the scan done. And then um, post-injury management, you know, obviously that's going to you know, require some rest and school accommodations and things like that, but also to try to get them back to their sports safely and totally healed so um, we don't have something called second impact syndrome. Um, anybody familiar with that, aside from another uh, um, So what second impact syndrome is, is when you sustain a second injury before the first one is healed. It only happens in younger people under the age of 25, and it's devastating. Depending on who you read, 50 to 
of those who suffer second impact are impaired some way forever. So that could be they have trouble reading, they're emotionally can't sleep, whatever, they have trouble learning, something like that. And again, depending on the numbers, because they're scattered, 25 to 40 percent of these people actually die because they get massive bleeding and swelling in the brain. Um, if you ever get a chance to watch the old EC E360 thing about uh, Preston Pluberties, he had second impact syndrome because he wasn't exactly truthful about his injury. Um, and he was fortunate that he was close enough to a great hospital that he literally could have been put on the gurney on the football field and pushed into the emergency room with a good strong arm. I mean, that's how lucky he was. And he now is probably 30 years old and, you know, can't cook for himself, can't shop, has, you know, speech defects and everything. So it, it, it is serious. And serious. What's the time, if you don't mind taking this, but what's, oh, what's the time period uh, between the initial injury and that, uh, you know, when are they safe? Is it all individual? It's How indiv do you determine it? It's individual. And we look at everything. We look at resolution of symptoms, return to normal cognitive status, and also a return to normal functional status. So this is not something a parent can look at a kid and say, I think he's okay. It's really something that's got to be managed by a doctor. It's something that's got to be managed by people who, who know. You know, if you break your wrist, Dr. Tim can probably tell you, hey, in five to six weeks, you'll be fine. I can guess when I first see it, but that's about it. It's, it's an educated guess at best. So we have emergency ac action plans. We're um, good at handling these together. If somebody is actually unconscious and we don't know what's going on, we're going to treat them as a head and neck injury, you know, board them, take all the precautions, um, get it safe. Sometimes is it overkill? Yes. Have we taken people out of games that probably didn't need to be taken out of games? Yes. Have we put people back into games that shouldn't have been put back into games? Yes. Because you can only deal with what is presented to you at the time, and sometimes concussion symptoms don't appear for 48 to 72 hours. But we try to, you know, we try to watch people. But the new mantra is, when in doubt, set them out. So if we have any concern at all, you're on the sidelines. Um, so what we do, there's a clinical interview. Hey, what happened? How, how did you get hit? What were you doing? Do you remember the play? What was going on? Um, were you knocked out? Um, do you remember stuff earlier in the day? How are you feeling now? All the symptoms stuff. We do a, a thorough exam, um, you know, looking at the neurologic system, obviously. And then um, some sort of um, neuropsychological testing. We decided to go with impact when we first started doing this or however many years ago, there are others out there. Basically what we're looking at is to get an idea of how the brain is functioning. So we like to have baselines before the season starts. So we know how you perform when you're normal, and then we have something to compare it to when you're injured. Now some people do okay from a cognitive standpoint, but are still really depressed or have a headache or their balance is off. Some people have a perfectly normal exam, and they can't remember three words. So it, there's no one test or one process that clears the whole clinical picture. Um, we use the neuropsychological testing to monitor recovery and try to help us make some recommendations for school because we can see, like, oh, they're, they're having difficulty with processing time. So if we are going to have them in school, they're going to need more time to do homework and tests and papers and things like that. Uh, go ahead. Um, just an example of kind of what the printout that we get um, can kind of tell you what they're looking like. Um, and it mentions um, what uh, predicts protracted recovery. So three of our four score areas are off compared to baseline. It's been shown that's going to be at least a month. If somebody is dizzy right away, it's probably going to be three or four weeks. If somebody is still in the fog, three to four days later, it's going to be a month. Statistics, no. Have I said that to somebody and said, you know, you've got this, it's probably going to be a month before you get better, they'll come back and see me in two weeks and be perfectly fine. Who knows? So, um, so what is a protract protracted concussion? We're looking probably 10 to 14 days now. Um, the majority of people, about 85 to 90% are better in three weeks, even if we don't do anything really aggressive. Um, 
But anything longer than that, we consider protracted. And there used to be all these grading systems with you know one, two, three, or you know all kinds of. There were I think at one point like eleven different concussion grading scales. We're basically now down to normal recovery, protracted recovery. So we don't know how to classify something until the end. There have been people who you know have been out cold and are better in a week, and people who get bumped and they're out for six, seven weeks. So you never know. There have been tests done with um, uh, motion sensors and helmets. There is no level of force that's been correlated with severity of injury. I mean, there's been a little, a little force. People are out for months. The hit that makes sports center, and they're better in, you know, a week. So we'll figure it out someday, maybe. Go ahead. Oh, I said different types of therapies for this. Last, um, different medications we use, and that's sort of where we get involved in trying to talk and help people through. Um, academic accommodations. You're all students, right? Things that we can do to help you. We can try to get notes from teachers. Um, clear desks so you're not distracted, so you can just totally focus in. Getting homework loads cut down. And we're trying to even get people to forgive some of the homework, although they're not very good about that. Different things to do on testing. Breaks during the day, maybe half days. Sort of treating it like um, an IEP. Um, at some times we have to go to homebound instruction because just the act of being in school and the noise in the hall and everything worsens concussion symptoms. And then cognitive therapy for those who help them. Don't think cognitive therapy like a psychologist, but this is more how do I organize my day? How do I remember my homework? How do I um, get back to retaining what I'm being taught? Do you have therapy for uh, no one gets a look? They get Um Vestibular therapy um, has become important um, too in physical therapy as well. Um, physical therapy, looking, you know, if there's neck problems, which we often see to help that out. And vestibular therapy to help people get their eye motion and balancing coordination back. Um, for any of you who ever have to go through this, and we tell this to every patient we see who we send to vestibular therapy, the first time you go there, you will absolutely feel awful when you leave. Because they are going to try to see what you can do to evoke all of your dizziness and stuff. What happens when you get on a roller coaster that's going too fast and you get dizzy? You feel, you feel sick, right? Yeah. I jump off. So that's <laughs> yeah. So they do the same thing. And that's kind of what some of this vestibular therapy is. Your brain constantly thinks like it's on a roller coaster, um, even though you're standing straight. And then the role of exercise, which is something new. Um, you know, there used to be, you know, the old, 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 long time ago, ah, suck it up, get ding, get back in the game, right? And then we went to, you're not doing anything, you're locked in a dark room. Well, we're finding out now that exercise after the first several days, if it does not increase symptoms, and this is low-grade exercise, may actually be beneficial. Emotionally, recovery, and also just from a physiologic standpoint, we think that the exercise might help get some blood flow into the brain a little bit better and help it heal. So the protocol they used uh, was, has come out of Buffalo, basically on a... Um, treadmill for 12 to 15 minutes at three and a half miles an hour, which isn't real fast, um, but the incline goes up every minute or so. If you can make it through that without any problems, then we start doing some more things as far as exercise goes. And then start getting into sports specific exercise. So um, that's some of those um, new ideas we talk about um, getting um, new brain cells to grow and everything like that. But what we do then in the recovery process as you're getting better, we start out doing basic cardio stuff. Like I said, you're on a treadmill, you're on a stationary bike, elliptical, something like that. Then we start doing some individual sports-specific activities. So, um, soccer, to say. We'll have you out dribbling um, the ball or taking penalty kicks or something like that. Then the next step after that is something like simple passing drill with a teammate. Then it progresses to sort of a full scrimmage contact kind of practice. And then if you can make it through all that and don't have a relapse of your symptoms, off you go back into the game, back to. So it can it can be a process even when you're feeling well and we think you're back to well to see what you do functionally, which is the most important thing. If you're just sitting vegetating, that's one thing. But if you want to get back to your sport or school and have a problem, it's another thing. 
Um, as I said, it takes a team approach. The student athlete, of course, is the center, but parents, family, coaches, athletic trainers, physical therapists, you know, sometimes the radiologists get involved if we do need an MRI or something like that. Uh, that's probably not a good thing. Last two weeks, please. Yeah. You can keep going. I think that's probably the end of what I was going to say. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the bottom. <laughs> that's <laughs> Aside from hitting your head again in the acute phase, that's exactly right. Video games are probably the next worst thing you can do. That's right. So I eventually allow them to get back into video games. No. I say it's back to family rules. And that's the same thing. And that's the same thing. A return to play as well. We can make a medical decision and say we think you're okay to go back. But parents have the, that final say because we have, you know, some kids who have been fine, and the parents are like, I don't want them to take that risk again. So it's a decision. Um, and a lot of the stuff I said we um, use in there, you know, a lot of um, sort of nutraceutical stuff. Um, fish oil, melatonin is great. Vitamin D is great. B vitamins are great for the right people. Magnesium is great. Hydration. You probably don't hear this enough, guys, already, but water is crucial to the recovery process. Blossom. Yeah, it was just a case we were doing. So this young man took, uh, keep going. We did, yeah, he took like two months to play. So a quick conclusion. <coughs> Individualized treatment, um, they say that, you know, even concussions within the same person are different. They're like snowflakes. Um, a team approach, as I said, coaches, parents, athletic trainers, physicians. Um, treatments to symptoms and dysfunction. There's no blanket treatment. Like, you know, if you have high blood pressure, you need to be on blood pressure medicine. You need to lower your cholesterol, right? We have to really sit down and tease out what it is that is aggravating you. And then um, the future, as I said, um, some visual exercise and uh, pediatric impact. I'm happy to report that we actually have up and running now. The initial impact is good from about 11 or 12 up through adults. Pediatric impact is um, valid now between um, ages of 5 and 11. And you do it on an iPad, so it's something that most of you guys are familiar with, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Any questions? How difficult is it to teach uh, coaches and parents to identify uh, concussions when they happen? Uh, do you have a training program? How does that, how do we get better at? We can certainly set something up for coaches and parents. Um, and there are a bunch of different little cards of, you know, for non-medical people to cave either some signs and symptoms that might indicate a problem. And if our children uh, suffer concussion, do you recommend that they, that they're, once we determine that it's likely they have one, to take them to a provider to kind of manage uh, their return? All the, yeah, all the, all the studies out there show that the quicker somebody gets to somebody who knows what they're doing with concussions, the quicker their recovery is. So if they're seen within the first 48 to 72 hours, their recovery is like that as opposed to like that. And there are a number of studies out there that show that. And then, a lot of that has to do with getting the right accommodations and things put into place for the schools and So a uh, family friend, uh, this, a girl that was playing high school basketball, got three concussions in the same season, and her doctor told her, you're, you're through with basketball. Is, is there a rule of thumb for, the, for a sport that you've had this many concussions? So where you just say, you're out of the sport? So one of the... Um, old um, grading scales, that would have been the case. If you have three in a season, you're done. We don't have a number now. It might be one. It might be seven or eight. We look at how much impact does it take to cause symptoms, how long is it taking you to recovery, how much risk are you willing to accept, because we know that once you have one, you're 16 to 20 percent more likely to get a second. And that number just keeps growing, and your recovery naturally is just going to be slower. 
So it, it again, it's that team approach. I I don't have an answer that a, a direct number that it's this many. Um, there was a college wrestler that I took care of who came to me after concussion number seven, and it basically if you touched his head, so like okay, wrestling. Is that He's like, well, can I do shot put? Great, you're not, you're not at risk. So he went on to complete his you know college athletic career as a shot putter, but he really liked wrestling. So that was that was a tough conversation to have. Um, I you know our colleagues in Pittsburgh, I've seen them disqualify umpires and you know hockey players, and and it, it it's a tough conversation to have. Um, a great one, great quick example. Um, major league catcher, nice guy, took a couple foul tips off the mask in an inning, you know, the twisting motion of his head. In between innings, had the pitcher against the dugout wall, which they said totally out of character. Came to see our colleagues in Pittsburgh, put him through the impact test and all this stuff and whatever. Thanks, Doc, I gotta catch up with my team, we're going to New York. They went through the test with him. Your reaction time is like triple what it's supposed to be. You're blah. And he said his first thought wasn't baseball. It was like, I got kids. I want to be able to take care of my kids. So it came home then. He was like done with it until they went through it. You know, think about it in baseball or hockey or whatever. You know, baseball, you've got roughly a quarter of a second or a third of a second to react to a fastball. If your reaction time is up to 1.3, 1.4, you're striking out a lot. A whole lot. So, and you're not safe. We now, on Friday nights at football games, you know, we used to just take their helmet and everybody knew that was a good sign. We now take their car keys. Because if your reaction time is that far off, it's like driving drunk. Can you also comment about um, expertise within the phys physicians in general? Because I don't think any kind of doctor would know enough about concussions to really properly manage a concussion. So uh, too often I see athletes come back and say, yeah, the doctor cleared me. And then you probe a little bit and the doctor who cleared him or her really should not be the one managing that patient's concussion. Right, and I, I, it, it has to be somebody who's knowledgeable and has the training in, in whatever it is. It might be a neurologist. It might be a primary care sports medicine doctor. It may be an orthopedist. Um, our athletic trainers on the sidelines are better than 90-something percent of the physicians we have out there because they deal with it all the time. Um, it just, you know, it's what training, you know, you have. It would, you know, if it's, you wouldn't go to somebody to have your ACL repaired if they've never repaired an ACL. A lot, of, a lot of the local pediatricians re refer concussion patients to Dr. Ross and Dr. Carter because they know they don't have the expertise to manage them. So. See them all over. We've had, we have neurologists you know, send them to it. You know, it's, it. It's all what you're, what you're trained to do. And, and experience is, you know, you'll see some things just like mm -hmm. anything else. There's something about seeing thousands that you figure out. Yes? So what's the protocol for, you know, speaking specifically if, you know, somebody takes a fall and they wipe out the pads um, and I'm taking a look at them and I feel like they might be at risk of, you know, suffering concussion. So what's the protocol at that point? They're on the ice, so step by step, what would be like how to bring them up, off the ice, um, where, where do we go? If, if there's no suspicion of neck injury, you know, just get them up slowly, Get them off the ice. You know, let let the protocol play out from there. Get them to their doctor and have them evaluated. And that's the key thing. If you think there's any chance that they have a concussion, they're done until they're evaluated by somebody. If you suspect there's a neck injury or something serious, or they have been knocked out, somebody somebody stabilize their head and neck and have somebody call 911. I mean that and don't move them until they, and they're going to want to move. And if I happen to be 
uh, on site. That's that's what I do. I, I talk to them, make sure they're answering questions properly. I you may see me do it, run my fingers through that neck and the back, and just initially don't have them move and check if they could move their fingers, hands, arms, and legs, and if they're okay, then I have them sit first and see how they do, and then eventually see if I could get them up. If they could do that, it's safe to get them off. Otherwise, if they're complaining of neck or low back, uh, a lot of the times, if it's severe, severe, severe enough, then, then there will be some neurologic symptoms. Right? If they have severe pain, they cannot stand, they cannot move things, then I will not move them and actually call 911 and put them on the board and hold their neck and head so that we don't further damage their injury. It's, you know, it's one thing to you know, hit the pads hard, you know, your back hurts, right? It, it's going to. But if they have you know, numbness down their legs or tingling or burning or feel that they can't move their legs, don't, you know, At the same time, we just cannot be too paralyzed by being right. too worried. Um, but a lot of the common sense that we use as physicians, parents, and the coach, 99.99% of the time, that will work. Most of the time, you know, if there's something really wrong, it's usually pretty obvious. Yes. So just to go back to that example, point, so if you're not 100% sure and the impact is not that bad, are there things you can do with the kids that ask the questions or motion? Are there anything like that you can do? Yeah, and the, and the questions now have become, they, you know, we used to have these standing, you know, what day is it, what season is it, who's the president, all this yeah. stuff. We're now getting to their activity related specific questions. You know, what were you doing? What play was it? What's the score? You know, what quarter are we in? Whatever, stuff like that. Because, you know, and all this crazy stuff, you know, counting back for, backwards from 100 by sevens or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, that, that, that is. I said that, right? You can't do that without a Serial sevens is a serious neurologic test and was used for a long time, but, you know. Some of us can't do it. <laughs> There's a part of the impact test that, you know, even non-concussed, there are a number of us that you, your brain's just not wired that way. I can't do it. 93. I just got to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the kids have been behaving better than the parents have. Today. Yeah, simple, yeah, simple word with the, with the kids, you know. <coughs> Pick out three things that are easy for you to remember, ask the kid, have them repeat them, then go off and, you know, ask them something else, but then come back, you know, a few minutes later, and, hey, what were those three words? Yeah. That's simple stuff. And if they have problems, it's simple. But ultimately, though, when in doubt, set them out. Yep. It's an actual slogan. Yep. Catchy. Is there a baseline? Uh, you talked about having a baseline. So how do you establish the baseline? Obviously, it's got to be before the injury. Is that something you do? Yeah. Kid, kids, can we go online and have our kids do a baseline that you have or that we have and that you can use to evaluate we them later? We can figure out a way for that, that to happen. Um, what happens in the high schools around here is the athletic trainer for the school takes all the freshmen down to the computer lab. And they do a baseline? And boom, yeah. away they go. Yeah, we can do that. So in Virginia, this is a state law. It's state law. Any high school athlete, including golfers, cheerleaders, they have to do this. And, and the, not just the athletes, parents need to sign off, meaning they need to be educated. They have to verify, oh yeah, I watched the presentation or uh, did something to be educated before the athlete could participate in school-sponsored sports. And our yeah. private club obviously doesn't have such things. So. This is something that we need to look into. It's usually better for somebody who's trained on it because it, I know when you're walking in a situation and um, unless you've actually taken the test or administered it, you know, so many times, having, like I've done it for an entire high school before, and when you have 30 kids coming in, it's better that you know um, because we have the training on it, so we're able to hook them up real quick anytime they have questions because I've taken it and it is hard. I have kids walk out of there they're like, I don't even want to practice. This thing is rough, you know, because they're just totally spent from this test. Um, but it's better for us to know or for us to administer it because they raise their hands and like, hey, what's this section? Because it goes by different sections, and it is, if you like I said, never done it before, it's a little complicated. 
So. Yeah, the, the two questions we get asked at every follow-up visit. Can I play? Do I have to take that test again? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get you into Harvard, kids. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get you into Harvard. So, um, is that test um, suitable for children, let's say, under the age of 10? Because we have a handful of those really young ones. Yeah. <laughs> Pediatric impact is from age 5 to 11, and so they actually have to take it on iPads. They can't take it on a regular computer because it's specific for a computer. And make it more like a game form. So, so uh, I'm sorry if I'm getting any details. We had an incident where my son uh, hit his head and it was skating. Uh, I went over and asked him some of these questions. I have a new track coach. I know some of these things. I he asked him who's president, got it, what's the day of the week, you got it, asked what's your address. But he didn't know that. And I thought, well, here's what we I didn't know if he knew that anyway. <laughs> Wrong question. But here's what happened though, but then he had a he had a slight headache. And then five minutes later he said, Oh yeah, I totally know my address. He didn't know it at the time, it was five minutes. So I told him this was a very important need. I said, "No, you're you're not, and you're not skating." Uh, the time I thought maybe I'm over cautious. But then uh, afterward, I did not take him uh, to get him checked out. I, uh, Dr. Kim did look at him, but uh, and I thought, well, the doctor's going to say rest, and, and we had our off season anyway. So my question was, I was I over cautious or under cautious? I think you're right on. I, you know, I think any of us up here would have done the same exact thing. They, Include, I didn't take him to the doctor. That would be okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, but you know, certainly sitting him on, I know that's a, that is a tough call at things like speed skating where there may be just a, one big event that right. you know, you've trained for for a whole year or two years or whatever. And, that's what it was. Yeah, and that's <laughs> tough. That's, that's tough to... That's tough. That's that's part of that's a part of the job I absolutely hate. But that's why it's nice to have relationships because they'll they'll listen. Um, one of our kayakers called us from uh, Italy a couple weeks ago. I, like, I don't think my shoulder is good enough to go. I'm not there to figure it out, but if you don't think you can go. It was probably worse having a yell in his ear for following three days. No, think of it, you know, at, at, at this age, um, you know, broken bones heal, for the most part. You've only got one brain, and even if you are really good at football or speed skating or whatever, you know, look, the average NFL career right now is three years. So at 24, 25, your NFL career is done. You need to do something for the rest of your life. If your brain's messed up, you might be. Chess. It'd be hard to play chess. <laughs> It'd be hard to play chess with a messed up brain. <laughs> we can probably figure out a way. We can probably figure out a way to make chess full contact. Do you know what role concussions play in ICT or? Ask a different expert, get a different answer. But I think there's a pretty strong link right now. I just said an article though that thinks the whole thing's a bunch of bunk, but uh, I think there's. Um, there was a. I, granted, it was only five people 17 years ago at UCLA. They did the same scan on the brain that detects the protein that's abnormal in Alzheimer's disease. They did it on five former NFL players who are still alive. All five. And the surprising people who get this are lying. Yeah, because they're, they're, they're really it's the constant, all the time. And it's, yeah, it, they, never get that, they never get the big hit. Right. Or, you know, usually the micro. Yeah. So that's one of the places um, where we're learning. Um, you know, and have a lot to learn there. Um, Bennett Amalo, who's in the movie Concussion, I actually heard him speak a couple times, and just what he's done is fascinating. If you look at the slides he puts up of normal brain and, you know, the brain of Mike Webster, you don't need a medical degree. I was going to ask one last thing before we break. Uh, 
for hockey, you know, uh, we like to think that speed skating has a much lower injury rate. We would love if those hockey players, parents, would determine that hockey is too dangerous. <laughs> what kind of evidence can you give us? <laughs> There's no evidence needed. He just needs, when he gives his this talk to the hockey parents, yeah. he just say, you should go do speed skating. <laughs> <laughs> In my expert opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but what's the legal one? With, with a high degree of medical certainty, <laughs> high medical certainty <laughs> that you should be playing hockey, that you, you should be speed skating. No. We'll send you the We'll give you a slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hockey <laughs> fan. <laughs> All of us are now. <laughs> no, that's not a reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's a source of yeah, yeah, yeah. penguins. <laughs> oh, not new to speed skating. He was here when the Junior Nationals was here five, six years ago. He will be here again at our Presidential Cup covering. Awesome. Those two, uh, those two uh, our trainers will also be there, Lanal and Taylor. So, uh, <laughs>